Hey guys, welcome back to our episode and everybody has just gone crazy for our next guest. (laughs) I love her so much and we just keep bringing her back because she is brilliant and I just love her so much. Her name is Lisa Fisher and she's got an amazing website and it's called Lisa Fisher Said and everyone's like, what? It doesn't make sense. And it's like, yep, because if Lisa Fisher said it, you want to do it. That's right. You need to do it. (laughs) So today we are talking about the top three roadblocks to weight loss. We're talking about thyroid, cortisol, hormones. We're talking about hormone replacement. We're talking about perimenopause, premenopause, menopause, and we're talking about reference ranges in lab work and so much more. So Lisa, welcome. Thank you for having me. I mean, people can walk out of here and get their continuing medical education hours, their CMA hours. You can you can get a PhD just on this episode because you and I both are very passionate about having women feel their best. And you have to do that by working sometimes with a provider and working with all these other things because nobody knows your body like you do. And that's that's really the whole thing about we were kind of talking, you know, if you talk about reference ranges, that's what the lab. So if you go wherever you go to LabCorp, whoever does it and what whatever your provider uses for Quest, it might be Quest, the reference range on something is here. But you're saying, well, it says I'm normal, but I don't feel normal. Am I done? No, you keep fighting for yourself. I fought for myself for four years before I finally got my thyroid diagnosis because somebody wasn't looking at the one number that needed to be looked at, and that is my thyroid antibodies. And they were off the page. So the thyroid gland, that's why reference ranges and TSH. So people go, no, what am I going to ask my doctor for? Thyroid stimulating hormone is something that doctors were told in the 80s, just check that and send them about their way because Abbott Laboratories introduced this test that could test the thyroid stimulating hormone. And now we know that that's erroneous. That's just one piece of a big puzzle. I mean, it's the corner, it's a corner piece. So it's important, but it's not the whole picture. So you have to look at free T3 and the range and see where you fall. Free T4, T3, T4. I know people are listening in their cars going, wait, wait, what? Uh, you know, we can put this maybe in show notes, but these are the common things you need to have your antibodies looked at. What do you, are your antibodies high? Yes. Yeah. And so let's just talk about that. So people like you and I that are um, tightly wound, you know, killing it, just energetic. We often with that comes a lot of stress and sometimes highly stressful lives like you and I both have, because we kind of work well in stress. I I do well spinning a lot of plates that often will make our thyroid antibodies go up. If your thyroid antibodies go up, it's kind of like um, the match to the gasoline. It it could erupt into other things. So that's why you do want to bring, I do think mitigating your thyroid antibodies is a big thing for people. um, And you have to work hard to do that. Someone like you that is, I mean, you're burning the candle at both ends. There is one thing that I'm surprised about you haven't discussed with me, and that's where we're going to do it now. And it's your cortisol. Do you know what your cortisol is? It's just crazy. It's actually, (laughs) and just so you guys know, cortisol, a lot of people don't realize it's a stress, it's the stress hormone cortisol. And it's your main job is to kind of wake you up in the morning. You know, it kind of starts about 2 a.m. And once it does its job and wakes you up, it should go down. And for many of us, this hormone is always high. And it's also called your fight or flight hormone. And so if you're getting chased by a bear or someone's about to knock you out, you know, you know, I'm going to run, right? So it's the only time, you know, you're going to kind of, it kicks into gear and you have what you need to run or to fight. And a lot of us, it's just common for our cortisol to stay high all the time. And so let's make that, I want to, I think we should talk about five. Let's, I want to call this the five roadblocks to weight loss. And and number one is stress. Um, So what can they do to kind of reduce that, that cortisol level? 
practice. Well, the first thing everyone needs to do every morning is the as the sun comes up, I want you to go outside with no sunglasses on, no sunscreen, no hat. And I want you to be outside and look at the sun as it's rising. You're not going to stare at the sun, but you're just going to tell your receptors that it's wakey, wakey time. And when it's wakey, wakey time, the body then will push out some cortisol to get you about your day. The other magical thing that happens is 14 hours after that wakey, wakey time where you're outside in the sunlight or as you're outside, your body just knows that it's morning time because we have all these artificial lights in our homes that don't tell us it's morning time. So when you do that, 14 hours later, your pineal gland then releases melatonin to tell you go night, night. So you're setting up your day for your night in the morning. And so you're pushing out morning cortisol, which like you said, you want it about 10 o'clock to be its peak. Then you want, you know, ish, then you want to come down the rest of the day. Someone, and I once was the person who did have mine peak much later in the day. I was getting that second wind at night and that puts you in adrenal fatigue because you're asking that fight or flight to push, push, push all the time. And you need to put a blanket on that. You need to soothe, you know, smolder the fire by taking ashwagandha or something, uh, adaptogens. As I said last time, my attorney wanted me to tell you, this is not medical advice. You are to seek the advice of your healthcare provider. But I know for me, that's what I've done and that helps. So the first thing you need to do is get that sunlight. It's really best to walk outside. This is crazy, y'all, with no shoes on so you can ground. Look up grounding and earthing. You need a whole podcast on that. It is fascinating. We need to go back ancestrally, eat the foods our ancestors ate. That reduces stress. The crap you eat in the drive through is made with all the bad seed oils. And those things also corrupt your physical health. Um, I, I don't know what it does to your cortisol, but it's probably stressful because it's not real food. Eat real food. So you get outside in the morning. At noon, I would get outside, I'd get some sunlight because I'd get that vitamin D up. That helps your thyroid antibodies to go down. And then tonight, as the sun sets, I go outside, I just sit on my porch. I'm not, I look at the sun just to see where it is, but sometimes it's this time of year, it's already behind a building or something. But my body knows, oh, it's starting to get dusk. Those things right there start working in tandem with your cortisol to have the peak you want in the morning and then for it to subside throughout the day. So that's one thing you can do. It's the low, low price of free. Doesn't cost you a thing. Well, and it also, people don't realize that cortisol it also helps contribute to, and it plays a role in controlling your blood sugar levels, managing how the body uses, utilizes carbs, fats, and proteins, and reducing inflammation. So it it does make a big bigger issue than people think. That's right. And I've got a story to go along with that. Yeah. So I don't want to interrupt you, but this no, is going to make ahead. sense. So in uh, health coaching school, I went to the in Institute for Integrative Nutrition, New York, and we distance learning. And a, a PhD chemist told a fascinating story about a woman she was training, uh, who was training for the New York City Marathon was her health coaching client. She's a PhD health coaching client. Um, the lady comes in, she hands in her food diary every two weeks, and she writes down how much she's exercised. You, I hope you're sitting down. After nine months, she was training 40 to 90 miles a week. I got real close to the microphone so you could see I'm really emphasizing. 40 to 90 miles a week for nine months and filled in a pristine food diary. Guess what? She gained 26 pounds. Do I need wow. to repeat that or should you stop the recorder and re rewind? She gained 26 pounds. Think about cortisol's effect on your blood sugar, your blood glucose, your insulin. So your insulin is different from your blood glucose. Insulin has to come out. The pancreas sends it to bring the blood glucose down. If you're under stress, and that means, think about it, running 40 to 90 miles a week, we were not wired to do that because the saber-toothed tiger only came after us maybe once a month not every day for nine months. So she's putting, logging in all those miles thinking I'm going to be a size four wearing my pencil skirt in Manhattan. When in fact, she's going to have to wear overalls because 26 pounds is a lot of weight and how frustrating it is. 
This is why I say there are a lot of fat people on the treadmill because you're focusing on the wrong thing. Cortisol is one of the elements that pushes out things to keep that blood glucose high. And if your blood glucose is high and your insulin's coming out, you ain't burning fat because what is insulin's job? It's to store fat. Insulin's job is to store fat. Now it comes out, it pushes my blood glucose down because I'm a long time intermittent faster. I'm uh, metabolically um, I, I, flexible. I, I'm I'm insulin sensitive. So I, I when I eat, I, I my insulin comes out, pushes the glucose to the cells and I go about my day. But if I were running all the time and trying to have, see the trying to have the pristine food diary produces cortisol. We've got to love ourselves. We've got to be nice to ourselves and tell ourselves, you know what? It's okay if I don't exercise today. God still loves me. So it is just so hard to overstate how important magnesium is for all aspects of our health. Everyone is talking about how critical magnesium is. And there is a long list of symptoms and diseases that can be eased or even treated with magnesium. So way back when, doctors used magnesium for all kinds of conditions like arrhythmia, constipation, preeclampsia, even seizures. And now it's kind of used as a last resort. It's absolutely essential to our health and our well-being. This is a huge problem because magnesium deficiency can increase your risk for all these different diseases. So I am really a big advocate of getting as many nutrients as we can through a well-balanced diet. Like that is super important. But I really feel like right now that food alone isn't going to work because our soil is so overworked and so mineral depleted that it's just lacking so much magnesium. Fortunately, by Optimizers has the solution. Their magnesium is the only one that has seven types of magnesium, and it's specially formulated to reach every tissue in your body. So go to magbreakthrough.com slash waste away. That's magbreakthrough.com slash waste away and get 10% off and use the code waste away to get your magnesium. Hmm. So good. Well, we just had a guest come on our our episode and here on uh, and we I love to have different guests and I don't always agree with everything that good for you says, you know, because yeah. I feel like you need to have different things and you have to decide what works for you. But anyway, we had this guest come on that wanted that was a big proponent of a plant-based vegan diet. And I'm obviously not a proponent of that. I feel like one of the biggest things I like to say about that is that you cannot get B12 unless you get it from an animal product. Or an and egg, yeah, right. That's yeah, right. so, so pretend, pretend that, you, I mean, God wouldn't make it where if you absolutely shouldn't be eating meat at all, there have to be another way for you to get B12 without taking it in a, in a vitamin form. Um, so that, that's kind of my, my big proponent of that. And that, but I, there's, we're, I don't even want to go down that road of all the reasons why I don't think that's the, the best thing, but we talked about um, why you're not losing weight. And one of the things that he said was people are eating too much fat and they're eating too much food and too many calories. And I still, I do agree with that. Like if you're doing this, this, that, you know, if you're intermittent fasting and you're doing this and you're doing that and you're doing this other thing and, but you're still, maybe you're eating in a six hour window, but you're you know, eating the the whole time in the six hours, the food that you're eating is not great. The amount of calories and the amount of content of food that you're going to eat is too much. And you're using food for something else other than I'm going to eat when I'm hungry. I'm going to stop when I'm full and, and overeating, of course, you're going to be gaining right. weight. That's right. And so um, I thought he he made some good points about that, but I want you to talk about kind of what what do you do? I mean, you look fantastic, and Thank I you. know that that you are you know doing a lot of meat right now. But let's say that somebody 
you know, doesn't want to do just a meat diet. They want to, maybe they want to do a paleo diet or something else, having vegetables. What's kind of, give them any tips that you would say like, okay, when I I was eating in a six hour window or four hour window, kind of talk about what you did and how you made kind of some of your food choices to stay as lean as you are. Okay, that's a great question. And I don't think what I do is right for everybody. We're a bio individual people and what works for me may not work. If I had a twin sister, I don't, but I'm saying it wouldn't work for her. So we're all different. So the first thing you need to do, everybody I think needs to do is mitigate the insulin response that we constantly have by um, reducing the amount of hours in the day you put food or flavor on a fork and put to your mouth. That includes the uh, no sugar drink that you get at um, the Wendy's in the morning or whatever you're doing, Sonic, whatever you're doing, you think, well, it has no calories, but it still releases insulin. So if we start understanding insulin's role, then we know, again, that insulin is a fat storing hormone. And so to reduce the amount of hours in the day that you eat, I started with six hours, but if eight hours is more palatable to you, pardon the pun, then you can do eight hours. And then weekly kind of cut it until you find your sweet spot. Dr. Bert Herring says, People really don't see the magic of appetite correction, which happens with intermittent fasters and real weight loss until they have a five hour eating window. And he said, and that's about four or five weeks after you've had a consistent five hour eating window. So that could be your goal. You could listen to this podcast, put it on your calendar and each week carve, carve out another hour. If you have to start with 12 and 12, do it. There's no judgment. So that's the first thing I would do. The second thing I would do is throw away every seed oil in your pantry and not buy foods that are cooked in seed oils. So that means, well, Lisa, I have to have um, the hamburger from this place. Great. They fry it. They fry that on a grill, remove the bun, eat all the vegetables with that you want, and then ask them, do you fry your potatoes in seed oils? A peanut oil is one. You can look up seed oils. And the answer is yes. So you know what? Skip it. Maybe get their baked potato and put real butter on it, real sour cream. Eat real food. Seed oils are not real food. They're industrialized. Uh, they're industrial seed oils that are processed in plants. If God made it, eat it. Beef tallow, pork lard, butter, olive oil, avocado oil. Those are things that are made from, you know, came from plants, the things that God made. So that's the se second thing I would do. Throwing away anything with seed oils. Number three, the first thing, the third thing I would do starting today, stop snacking. Eat, stop, eat. If you understand mitigating your insulin, and because the insulin, remember, prevents you from burning fat. If you can bring it down, then magically your blood pressure goes down. Um, all these people that will say, well, my blood pressure is high. It's because you your insulin is too high. And that's what Dr. Bickman talks about and why we get sick. Insulin resistance is the root cause to the 10 most common illnesses, including cancer, diabetes, uh, dementia, I mean, PCOS. I mean, these are things that we talk about like it was having, you know, the common cold. Oh, yeah, he's got type 2 diabetes. No, we need to stop and go, I'm going to stop and pray for you because that is a terrible illness that you can reverse by reducing the amount of hours in the day that you eat, according to Dr. Bickman. So those are three things you could do today. Mm, I love that. And the thing is, is that the, the seed oils like canola, corn, sunflower, I mean, because people think like, I don't know why, but people think canola oil is good or, you know, sun. You know why? American Heart Association many years ago put a heart on it, said it was heart healthy. Huh, let's follow the money, people. Just follow the money on these things. I don't listen to any. I don't listen to the government on how to run my life and how to fuel my body and what to put in my body, period. Mm, yeah, for sure. Um, and I, I think that's so good of figuring out like, even how you feel and, you know, cooking in, you know, coconut oil or mm. olive oil or butter, butter, like a yeah. butter and pork lard, fry the bacon, uh, save the grease and cook something in it later. I'm we're having pork later. I mean, all we eat is, you know, beef, bacon and butter. So, but I still try to mix it up, uh, but it's so flavorful. And you're, and that's the other thing that we hadn't talked about there. The problem with high carb foods and a plant diet, 
diet, plant-based diet is high carbohydrates because those vegetables are carbs, right? Now you could eat a lot of avocado and a lot of those people don't eat cheese and stuff. It depends on where you are on this, that food spectrum, but there are only certain foods that fire your hormone satiety signals. And those are foods with fat and protein. So if you're eating salads and um, one of those, you know, opaque fishes that don't have any fat in it, girl, you're going to be hungry in about an hour. I'm not. I'll have my hamburger today when I open my eating window. <clears throat> I might have, some, I do eat cheese, so I might have some cheese with it. And then I'll have my steak later. I, I wouldn't think about eating in between because my hormone satiety signals tell me no more, you're done. But if you're not eating the right foods, those hormone satiety signals don't fire and you be hungry. Mm, I love that. So I want you to talk a little bit more about that five hour eating window, because I think that is magical. It's funny because I um, was have been eating mostly in a six hour eating window, but I noticed that when I go down to five, that is kind of a really, really sweet spot. Talk a little more about that. Well, Dr. Bird Herring in his book, The Five-Hour Diet, he was the first person on the scene 20 years ago. Michael Mosley was known for what he did for the BBC, but Dr. Bird Herring was the first person to say, you know what, if you eat in a five-hour window, that you will start seeing uh, this weight loss because you'll mitigate your insulin. Mm. So with that, um, that was in 2003, so almost 20 years ago. And then he did the research on, he said, and at that point, when you eat in a five-hour window and you do it, remember about three or four weeks, then your apostat starts regulating. And apostat is the hormone function in the brain and the hypothalamus that tells you you're full. And that's why people who do intermittent fasting say, I magically all of a sudden had appetite correction. That's because your apostat got involved in that. He said that is fired after the five-hour window. So he's the one who really said, if you want to see weight loss, you're going to have to go to a five-hour window. Now, depending on what your insulin levels are, some people then have to do an every other day diet. Um, they have to do extended fasting. Some of those things you do need to be under the care of a medical provider for that. But a lot of times, some of my clients, this is what they do. They eat, let's say Thursday night, they skip Friday. And then they, that's one of my clients is doing Saturday. She's going to wake up and have brunch. She might even have a little snack and then dinner that night. So she's going to have a longer eating window on the back side of that. So that's another way to kind of see what's going on because what you're trying to do is regulate that insulin and become insulin sensitive. Hey guys, I'm so excited. My new book, One Meal and a Tasting is out now. And if you order the book on Amazon, just the regular paperback edition, if you go in and make a review, you will get the audio book for free. Send a copy of your receipt to questions at chantelrayway.com and you'll get the audio book right away. Um, I'm going to read us a question from some a listener in Dallas, Texas. Oh, good. Um, it says, I want you to know that after listening to your book, Waste Away, on audiobook five times, I've lost 37 pounds. Awesome. I'm currently eating in a six-hour window, and I'm 49 years old. Lately, I'm so hungry in the morning, and I'm feeling nauseous around 9 or 10 a.m., and I have increased my thyroid medicine. So I'm wondering if that's the reason why. If I'm then eating in the morning and I'm only eating six hours, then I'm not having dinner. It's hard. And I'm not going to read the rest because it's, yeah, right. it's really long. But basically what she's saying is, she basically says, I used to eat from, let's say, 12 to 6 or 1 to 7. And now she's getting, she's increased her thyroid medicine and because she needs it. But then by 9 a.m. or 10 a.m., she's like, I can't, I, I literally feel nauseous. So I feel like I need to eat. And she has all these plans, like I'm not going to eat dinner. I'm not going to eat dinner. And that sounds good. She's like, I love doing, you know, one to seven or whatever, because then I could go to dinner if we had a party and that sort of thing. And she's saying, but now because she's upped her thyroid medicine, she's so hungry in the morning that she has to eat something. What what is the solution for her? Is what well, that's a great question because let me explain what thyroid 
um, medicine does. It's it's a hormone replacement therapy or what I take because I don't take the synthetic. I take um, NP thyroid. And when you do that, Chantel, what you are doing is increasing your metabolic rate because low thyroid has what? Low metabolism. When your thyroid starts increasing, you and when you need, when your thyroid increases, your metabolism increases, guess what else increases? Your appetite. Tell her to eat. Eat in the morning. Eat at 9 a.m. Love yourself. Eat at 9 a.m. Eat what you want. If you want to go ahead and have your, uh, there's a lot of people, the thought leaders who like people who like it when people eat that big breakfast, eat a smaller lunch, and they're done for the day. That their intermittent fasting is front loaded. She might need to do that because that's what I'm saying. Bioindividuality, what works for me and my schedule may not work for anybody else. So I would say, eat if you are white knuckling it, that's what Jen Stevens, the famous author who wrote Fast Feast Repeat says in the Mother of Intermittent Fasting. She says, if you're white knuckling it, you kind of have to ask. Now she does have to look to make sure that she is eating. My son's the one who told me the trick that he closes his eating window with a fat. So he closes his eating window with an avocado or peanut butter and crackers or something because he ha- says it helps him long-term satiety, meaning into the next day. But you also have to ask for her, is she getting enough magnesium? Is she, you know, put make sure you salt your food well, have the Himalayan salt or the Celtic sea salt, put that under your tongue, try all the little tricks. And if that's not working, by golly, eat. Because it's yeah, not a and, crime. Eating is a good thing. And, and I think that, you know, one of the other suggestions is, you know, on like if on like a Friday or a Saturday, um, you know, if you've if you're going to extend your eating window to eight hours on that that day, then no problem. So, you know, that is, you know, it, it is good to change it up to, you know, con, you know, to constantly be in the same eating window, you know, one day, maybe four hours, one day, maybe Very good. six hours, mm-hmm. one day, maybe eight hour is fine to change it up so that your body's not guessing. I mean, to keep your body guessing. Yeah, to keep your body guessing. Say. She might need to just do that for a couple of days to soothe her fire, whatever. It may be producing cortisol in her too because she may be stressed about it. Remember the cortisol then trips the other things and then you're back in your, you know, fat girl genes. So you have to kind of do some things. You have to keep changing it up. And that's great advice. Okay, so number one, we said stress. Stress can make you right make you that. Number two, we talked about just flat overeating, right? Yeah, Think in your mind that you're not overeating, but you really right. are overeating. Um, let's dive in a little bit more on hormone deficiency and getting that going. We we briefly talked about um, some hormone replacement therapy, but I want to talk about that a little bit more in detail. So. Um, kind of talk about your journey a little bit and kind of the different types of hormone replacement therapy and what you suggest someone to do if they feel like, hey, I, you kind of know, like, you know, like something is off with me. What is, what are the steps they need to do? And talk a little bit about your story. Well, 20 years ago is when I started noticing. So remember, thyroid's a hormone. And what we're talking about today are these hormones, which are chemical messengers. Vitamin D is a hormone. It's not a vitamin. So we have to pay attention to these in order for your head to your toe to all work right. So 20 years ago, and really more than that, I was saying something was wrong. I was tired, constipated, cold. I was losing the outer third of my eyebrows. My uh, nails were splitting. I'd gained weight, but nobody, they just patted me on the leg. So I got that first hormone of mine that I got regulated was my thyroid hormone. And I didn't feel my best until I was on armor or NP thyroid. That's different for everybody. So then uh, I'm, I'm almost 60. So that was, I was about 39. And then right after that, um, and I was under, you know, I'm just, again, wired to do a lot. I was homeschooling my kids. I've been a radio TV personality since there were shoulder pads. I mean, since Dynasty was on the air. So a really long time. And um, at that point, um, I started, I went back to the radio. I'd kind of taken a hiatus while I was homeschooling my kids. I still homeschooled and was on the radio. So I'd have to get up at 3.45 or 4 a.m. That produces cortisol. Remember, that's a lot of stress to my body. I didn't realize that. And then I started creeping into perimenopause. And that's when you wake up even earlier and you're wide awake. 
And that's when women start. And that's when you you start hating your family. You don't know why you hate your family. You just hate the way they breathe. You hate the fact that they wanted chicken nuggets for dinner. You know, it's it's a normal thing. Somebody's listening right now going, well, I never had those symptoms. Well, that's great. I did. <laughs> and I adore my family. I've been married to that same man who I think just streaked in front of your glass window. You can see it in my window here um, for 35 years. So I adore him. I adore my kids. But there is this angst that comes about women when they go through perimenopause, which may be harder. I talked to an obstetrician yesterday. She said, I really think perimenopause is more challenging than even menopause and postmenopause because it's the first time that things start sputtering. You have those long uh, menstrual cycles or short ones. You have so much bleeding and for thyroid patients, especially we have so much bleeding. Doctors do this. They go, we'll just do an ablation. We'll just take your parts out. Keep your parts, people. Keep your gallbladder unless it's diseased. But those are panaceas. I go, this is going to solve it for you. And it doesn't. So I did like so many other women went through those things. And I started with progesterone and I do the bioidentical because those synthetic progestins, some people say need a black box warning, um, the Prempro, Premarin or whatever you get from your physician. That's the synthetic. Your body, my friend, Amy Beard, amybeardmd.com, Dr. Amy Beard's functional medicine doctor, she says, your body does not lack synthetic hormones. It's lacking your real hormones and bioidentical or molecularly uh, bioequivalent or whatever the terms are, just like your hormones. So I started with bioidentical uh, progesterone about 15 years ago, and that helped me. I've never even, in fasting, get this, I've never had a hot flash. And, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm 100 years old, but I've never had a hot flash because fasting helps mitigate some um, things with hormones as well. Have you noticed that? Have you had any hot flashes or any of that? Yeah, I I don't I don't know if I've had a hot flash because I don't know. No, exactly. If I, I think have, you would I, know that people say because I said that once I go, oh, you would know. Yeah, like, but I do get hot. I'm not like sweating. I don't, I don't, I, you know, some people are like, oh my God, you just start like start sweating. Yeah, I've but never I done do that. feel overwhelming hot. Like I'm like, well, like, that could be I, a thyroid thing too. Cause your thyroid is your um, thermostat to your body and the way that you metabolize, um, because I know you do lyothyronine or cytomel or whatever it is, you, you take something that has T3 in it, that T3 shoots up. It has a, about a six hour half-life and it kind of dumps everything and you may have a little boost then and you may at that point. So I would look at that in your day. Have you in the middle of the night had to like strip off clothes and all that? In the middle of the night, I am hot. I, I don't, I I don't wear anything to bed, but I just will like oh, fling off my, now I, we know. Okay. I fling off my, my, my blanket. Your one sheet, Definitely. right. <laughs> and I'm constantly like, Ryan, please put the put the temperature down. My husband, I, he's going to, have to go to bed with mittens because <laughs> now I am warmer than your average bear, but I've never, <laughs> I've never had a hot flash. So, and I do think it's because I started on that bioidentical hormone replacement train early. And you know what? I ended up liking my family better. Here's the other thing that I started doing during that time. Here's my true confession. I've never told anybody. Um, I started drinking wine the whole wine o'clock and mommy juice and all that, it's probably women during their perimenopause years. I had heart palpitations so much during perimenopause that um, I thought that would, it's a depressant alcohol. I thought it would soothe it. It didn't. And now I know by following the women from Wise and Well, they said that if you have bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, whether through pelleting or whatever it is, you need to push away the alcohol because it can produce a pathway you don't want of estrone. And somebody, if you're looking things up, look up estrone pathway. You don't want it. So now I've pretty much eliminated alcohol, but on occasion, like my son's driving in from Dallas today and we're going to have Mexican food. And so I'm this, so what I do is a meat-based diet. Um, I eat meat all the time, but one meal a week, I might have something that's not meat-based. So you know, Mexican food has a lot of corn, corn tortillas and corn products in it. So all that, I'll probably have a margarita because I want to, you know, I'm going to the Mexican restaurant, but I typically don't do that because I'm trying to protect these hormones. That's what you need to do is protect your hormones and make sure they communicate well. Mm. So, 
So let's talk about thyroid a little bit and then lab work of what you suggest. First, talk about what you're taking. And obviously, guys, just because you're hearing what she's taking, you have to see a doctor and they have to tell you what it is. But I do think it's important to hear kind of what different people are taking, the amounts they're taking. I'll share mine afterwards and kind of what the the values that you are looking for when you're taking your thyroid of the ranges that make you feel optimal? Well, that's a great question too. So when I first got diagnosed, um, I finally, you know, it took four years to get diagnosed and I had a pretty sizable goiter in my, your antibodies at that point shouldn't have been over 39. Mine were 1300. And then mine jumped to 2400 when my dear friend was murdered here in Little Rock. It's a famous murder. Ann Presley, she was a TV anchor. See what stress did. It held, I mean, I went to, my body went to hell. It was horrible and emotionally. I mean, it was just a tough time, but see what stress does. So he started me on 75 micrograms of Synthroid. And because I am a journalist and journalists are extremely curious and we're researchers, I went and read all the books. Well, it said you only take you take 75 micrograms of synthroid if you weigh 75 because it's kind of titrated per pound based on body weight. Now weigh I weigh about 150. I'm five eight. I'm normal size, you know. Um, and so I went back to him at four weeks and had the lab work done, and I was so excited. I said, "Okay, up the ante." And he said, "Oh no," he said, "I checked your your uh, TSH. Your TSH is one." And I go, "What does that do with anything?" He said, "We believe," meaning the Academy of Endocrinologists of the Americas or whoever they are, we believe that one is a good number for your TSH. And I went, he said, we, and I go, is there a mouse in your pocket? Because talk to my husband, I'm still not Lisa yet. I'm not Lisa. He goes, you're moving in that direction. He goes, give it six months. I go, I don't have six months, mister. I'm going to be dead in six months if you don't get me feeling better. So he would not give me any more. And I said, well, then I've also been researching about uh, T3. So Synthroid or levothyroxine is synthetic, levothyroxine synthetic T4. And I said, well, I've been reading about T3 and how magical that is and how the body needs it. The book was called The Thyroid Solution, Rita Aram. I read it in 2002, changed my life, 2003. And he said, well, we don't want to do that. I was 39. He goes, we're afraid you'll have heart palpitations Uh, in our older clients. I go, not even 40. And he said, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I might bump you up to 88 micrograms. I said, but I don't feel my best. So who cares what that piece of paper says? So I broke up with him. I started dating around, meaning I started looking at another provider. It took me a few years. I finally found a provider who said, you know what? We're not going to really look at those numbers. I mean, we're there. We have an idea of what's going on, but we're going to go by how you feel. And I had tears when that doctor told me that I had to wipe the tears And I was like, seriously? So now I go by how I feel. I take 120 milligrams. It's measured differently than uh, levothyroxine of NP thyroid. There's armor, NP, nature thyroid. There are a lot of those of the complete thyroid have all the components of T4, T3, T2, T1, T0, and calcitonin. You can't get that in a lab. And then, so it's made from pig, porcine right? Porcine. And then I also take a little levothyroxine. I do need some T4 because I do will get adhesive capsulitis, which happens sometimes to women. And um, the way to eradicate that is sometimes I do need a little more T4. So I do look at my numbers because free T3 is really the most important one of the whole spectrum. So if you come to me and say, my doctor did my test, he did TSH. Remember, it's that one piece of the puzzle. T3 is really a really big piece because it tells you what's available. So that's how I do it. And I really, I don't look at numbers because let me tell you, when you take this much armor or NP, it will suppress your TSH. And mine's at 0.001 or something. Nobody's worried about it. My blood pressure is fine. I finally brought my antibodies down from 2,400 to 39 because I get out in the sun every day. Vitamin D brings the antibodies down. So you see it all works in tandem. Mm. 
Hey guys, I really want you to join our Intermittent Fasting and OMAD Facebook group. We're doing tons of giveaways right now for posting your before and after pictures and just for posting a question in there. We're giving away free protein shakes, some digest aid, all kinds of fun stuff. So please join our Intermittent Fasting and OMAD Facebook group. The link is in the show notes. Um, I'd love for you guys to go to chantelrayway.com slash bloodwork. Um, that yeah, I love that. Dot com love slash that bloodwork. And I give a list of all the different tests that you should ask your doctor to take. Because like she said, almost all the regular doctors will say, oh, let's just do TSH. And they don't do the full panel. That's right. And I put on there the lab range, which for example, they might say, the lab range is 0.45 to 5.5 for your TSH. Which is ridiculous. And it's, it's crazy. Um, and then I'll say, okay, here's the lab range. For me, optimal range is 0.5 to 1.5. Um, but again, it's not just TSH. It's total T4, T3 uptake, total T3, like all That's of That's right. Looking at each one. Where do you see where most people have the biggest problem um, if you're you're looking at their lab work and looking at their tests, when you say oh, they're not feeling good, where do you see that they're they're kind of off? Well, the doctor's looking at TSH, and that is misguided. It is free T3. Look at that free T3. This is how a doctor explained it to me. He said, you know, you get on your phone and you order from Amazon. He goes, you put the information in. He goes, that's your TSH. You know, when the the Amazon box is dropped off at your door, that's your T4. But you can't. Until you open the box to see what's inside, you can't use it, right? He goes, when you open your box, that's your T3. That's what's available. So the TSH is something that is, a, it's it's a marker and T4 is, but not until you open the box and see what your free T3 is. That's how you know really how you're feeling. But if you ladies listen to me, if you are still having symptoms, this is what I tell my clients, go and Print out the hypothyroid symptoms, circle them, find a communicate, find someone you can communicate with, a healthcare provider who will say, well, we're going to make, that's what the doctor told me. He said, I want you to feel better. And I said, nobody's even put that into the equation in talking to me. All they cared about was my lab values. Find a provider who will allow you to feel your best so that you don't hate your family, that you don't want to drink wine every afternoon. Those, I mean, and that played into my female hormones were starting to wane, but your thyroid is the gas pedal to the body. So if the thyroid doesn't work right, work right, it's in control of all your endocrine system. So that's your ovaries, people. So it all works together, but you've got to get that thyroid right, really, before you can probably address your sex hormones. Mm. So let's talk, uh, we, we kind of had all of our different ones. What's another piece of what's holding people back from losing the weight that they want to? So we've talked about stress. Um, we've talked about the hormones. I want to, before, I do want to talk about hidden inflammation. We, we uh, talked on it, yes. but I feel like there is mad people are just more inflamed than ever. So let's talk a little bit about hidden inflammation and where you're seeing people have results with that. Well, a lot of people can eliminate um, this hit, inflammation with food elimination. So there are a lot, remember we're eating fake foods. So our bodies were not designed to eat Pop-Tarts and cereal and Ice, even ice cream, because there are carrageenans, that's how it's pronounced sometimes, in there that are artificial elements that are added to foods that your body looks at everything as a foreign invader. So when I went strictly meat-based, for me, I got rid of the hip inflammation. Immediately, I'm trying to repigment my skin, my vitiligo right now. So hidden inflammation is often tied to foods. But then it's tied to toxins, environmental toxins, um, whether you're in a building that's airtight and it hasn't been aired out, whether there is carpet, you know, sometimes carpet bothers people, whether um, you live with a smoker, whether you 
perfumes, all the things we put on our bodies. Jen Stevens' recent book, Clean-ish, addresses that. We, She says it's something like, it's insane, Chantel, it's something like 17 products, artificial products we put on our skin before 8 a.m., including the toothpaste we use. I use fluoride-free toothpaste. But the toothpaste we use, the deodorant we use, um, the dental floss we use also has products in it, those things can be hidden inflammation that can bother you. The other component to your weight, hallelujah, sleep. If you're not getting seven to nine hours of good sleep, you are compromising your body's ability to regulate your insulin and it affects your metabolism. Ask any shift care worker, um, ask any physician that's going through medical school and they're working overnights and they'll say, well, it's because I was eating the donuts and all that. You were craving the donuts and all that because you weren't getting the sleep you needed that provided you the rest that get, got you to the point where remember those um, satiety hormones weren't firing. My satiety hormones fire. My sleep is so important to me because remember all those years I did morning radio, I would sleep like six and a half, seven, and that, that's not good. And it's not cool. You know, it used to be a Wall Street thing. You know, you sleep when you're dead. I got to go out here. I got to make this money. I got to work, work, work. No, you don't. You're not going to, you can't work if you're dead. So sleep. Hmm. So there you have it. Number one, stress. Number two, your hormones, meaning your cortisol, checking your thyroid, what all your, your different hormones as far as estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, checking all of those hidden inflammation, overeating, and sleep. So checking on those is super, super important Important to kind of go down the list and go, where, where do I need to get myself back on track? So let's talk a little bit about hormone replacement therapy. And we talked about it a little bit earlier um, as far as in our last show, but I want to kind of talk a little bit more about kind of the, the transdermal, the suppositories, the pellets, you know, what to do on kind of the different options and what's kind of the, the best way to go about it. And this is a very subjective conversation. Some providers do not like the pellet therapy. And the pellet is the size of a grain of rice. You know, it's tiny. It's inserted inside your butt cheek. They numb the area. And then you go about your day. You can do estradiol and testosterone and then take progesterone through a capsule or transdermal. But that that is not for everybody that's what I do. It works well for me. A doctor I talked to you, but I have trouble with the testosterone because I was getting, you know, 16 year old acne and, um, you know, growing a beard. My voice was deeper, you know, all those things. Um, so it didn't work for me. A doctor yesterday said you can, there are ways to mitigate that though, you know, break, you, you have to check a lot of things. So that's my option, but that is not everybody's option. The others are transdermal. And I did start, my progesterone journey did start transdermal now that I think about it. And then as you go through menopause and you're no longer shedding that lining where progesterone comes in, you know, your ovaries produce these things, you shed the lining. Um, and that's what a period is. When you're no longer doing that, then you're, you won't release the progesterone. You won't have the progesterone that you had. So now I take, I take a lot. I take 250 milligrams, um, every night. I take those through capsules. Some people do vaginal suppositories, um, or the transdermal. That's why you really need to find a provider. The people I work with here in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I'll send you We'll post the um, link to that because I have a discount code. If you order their saliva testing or um, the Dutch test from them, you'll get 25% off with Lisa in the code. But the thing with that is then you meet with them, you, you pay for that, then you meet with them, a hormone specialist, but you have to find someone and good luck to write it for you in your state. We were trying to have physicians here to course communicate with people virtually, but they have to be licensed in every state. So you have a provider there. What we need to do, I mean, seriously, Chantel, is get a list of a provider in every state that we could have as a resource. In fact, I'm putting, I'm, that's gonna be my goal, that we can find somebody, because so many people now are meeting virtually. And if you could find a, 
provider who will just meet with a woman for 15 minutes after she's had the testing done, then that provider can help you decide, do I want suppositories? Do I want, now, if you have to have a uh, pelleting therapy, you'd have to find a provider to do that. But I really think that we can band together and make America hormonally functional again. I made that up. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, I have another um, uh, question and it's it's so long that I'm, I'm going to summarize it for you. It's from okay. a girl named Christy Welch. And she says she talks about how she was taking her thyroid um, t- once a day and then it just wasn't enough. So she split it where she was taking it in the morning and then in the afternoon. And then she could never remember taking it in the afternoon. And she was trying to take it like around one o'clock in the afternoon. And then that was around lunchtime. She didn't want to take it with food. She would set an alarm and then she would forget about it. <laughs> and it was, just, it was a really long yes. thing, but it was yes. really funny. It was actually a great, great question about that. And then she would end up taking her thyroid around four o'clock and then it would go, then, then it would be too late. Like she's, she was like, well, I'm eating my food. So then let me take it at four o'clock or five o'clock. Then she couldn't sleep at night because it was <laughs> too much. So it was, it was such a good question. Um, but that was the gist of it. So what is your opinion on taking thyroid? You know, then she says she went back to just doing it once a day because she just got to the point where she was like, okay, this isn't working. I'm, I'm now not taking it. Now I'm all over the place. I might as well just take it once a day. So what is your, your thoughts on that? Well, she's overthinking it. The thyroid medicine isn't that much smarter than us. It's good to take it in the morning on an empty stomach, but then the afternoon dose, just take it. If that is a problem because the ADD crowd, I'll raise my hand, we have a hard time remembering. Um, you can ask a pharmacy, a compounding pharmacy to take that and make a slow release of it. So see, remember I said it had T3 in it, that T3 spikes at about six hours. So she may have had a little bit of a, it's not a, a boost like you're going to run a marathon, but it does kind of kind of give you a cognitive eye-opening experience, or some people say that. So she, if she goes to a compounding pharmacy, they could she could take it in the morning and it would slowly release for 24 hours. That is one of the, I will say, of the thyroid I take. So I take my 60 milligrams in the morning. And I take, I really take my 60, probably around three o'clock. Now I'm not eating around that time, but I don't overthink it. If that's when I'm going to have my meal, I'm just going to have it. You just need some thyroid hormone replacement to get the little gland uh, chugging along. So you're doing 60 in the morning and then 60. Yeah. Then 60 in the afternoon in the morning, I take 75 micrograms of levothyroxine with it. And then remember, we've talked about this. I do a weird thing, y'all. I take um, Wednesday afternoons off and I don't take it Sundays. And my doctor even told me recently, he said, you're looking too much at that TSH. He said, if your blood pressure is fine, mine's like 100 over 70. I mean, it's silly low. He said, if you are, if your blood pressure is good, if your heart rate is good, mine's 80. I mean, you know, remember, I'm kind of wound up anyway. I, all the time. Um, but if it's not, it's not a hundred or anything. He said, if that's all fine, this is an old school endocrinologist who's 82 years old, who still consults with me. He said, if those things are fine and you feel your best and you're vibrant and you're sleeping well, mm-hmm. he goes, don't, don't over. He said that don't overthink. So, having to so take you're Sundays taking, off. you're taking the, um, the 60 of armor, is that right? Or NP, yeah, kind of same thing. Yeah, or MP, yeah. 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 So you do 60 of that in the morning and then you do another 60 plus you do the 75 of the Synthroid and you're doing that in the morning, the mm-hmm. Synthroid. Mm-hmm. Synthroid for sure was packaged saying, take on an empty stomach. I don't remember that armor and the others had the package insert about taking on an empty stomach, but I don't remember because we used to were told too not to have any dairy products within an hour of taking it. But see, I'm an intermittent faster, so I don't even think about eating till later in the day. So it, it would never, and that's the only medicine I take. And I say that, yes, I say that. And the reason I say that is I don't even call that medicine because I'm re- I'm not taking a drug. I'm replacing my hormone. Same thing with if I were to go to a hospital and they'd say, what medicines are you on? The women from Wise and Well told me, they say, 
we don't call what we do is medicine. We're replacing our hormones. So it's not a drug. It's replace it's hormone replacement therapy. So there you go. Well, one of the things that is a big problem issue for me is that I eat very, very healthy, but I go in these kicks where like, I'm like, I'm not going to have any dairy. I'm not going to have any grains. I'm eating like, I mean, I'll just eat perfect, perfect patty, clean, clean, clean. And I'll have, you know, just really protein and vegetables. Well, the problem is my thyroid works so much faster when I don't have any grains at all. But I literally kind of like after about, you know, five days of doing that, I snap and I'm like, that's it. Like if someone doesn't give me a piece of gluten-free toast, I'm yeah. going to kill somebody, you know, and it's, or I'll have So that. you even, you're saying even the gluten-free, because we know that gluten compromises the thyroid. We know they're not friends, but you're saying even if you grains eat gluten, in general. Eat grains in it general, just okay. makes my thyroid, if, if I literally, Very if interesting. I ate was protein and vegetables, my thyroid goes on to overdrive, like that's a, absolute that's really overdrive. And so I actually have, and it, I have my thyroid on a compounded pharmacy. Okay. I yeah. actually have like a small, a lower dose. And I, I only take, I take 90 um, micrograms of, it's like an armor, right? Like, yeah, it's, right. It's complete like, thyroid. Yeah. yeah. But it's complete compounded and I do 90, I think it's 90 and 10 and then 90 of T4 and 10 of T3. And then I have another one that's like 120, um, 120 and 10. And so just if I'm eating cleaner, I kind of can stay in that 90 range. That's interesting. And then if I'm kind of just like, screw it, I'm going to eat kind of what I want. I'm, I need to be in the 120 range. So I actually have both bottles and it just, I kind of can sense my body of like, okay, where am I at? Like, am I feeling like, you know, I'm, you know, having a lot of energy or whatever, then I'm kind of at that 120 range, which again, we all have our little things. Like you have the one day off you, we have our little things that we kind of listen to our body and go, that's the key what's working with me and what's not. You're listening to your body. And that makes that makes the healthcare provider's job easier because you can walk in and say, I know how this works, this temple right here. <clears throat> and I know that if I'm doing this, that I'm going to have these symptoms if I'm doing this. But you're also showing us, and that's what we were talking about, um, those silent uh, inflammatory markers. Food is big. Mm-hmm. Food is food is huge. And I do have my clients um, when they so I, I do intermittent fasting coaching groups and I've got another one that starts the first week in October. Then go to Lisa Fisher said dot com, get signed up. It's a hundred bucks. It's nothing. We meet five times. But then after I only health coach really at that point after you've been through fasting, because fasting to me is the football field of our lives. It is the what the only way that I can see that my life can work is through intermittent fasting. So with that, then you can, I can start mitigating with people saying, now let's remove dairy from your diet. And people are mad. They're holding on. It's like back in the seventies when people first start saying, you're going to have to quit smoking. And people are going, I would quit what, you know, or their diet Cokes, you know, that was the addiction. Then now we're seeing the addiction is not addiction, but there are things that cause us we have to have it of dairy dairy and wheat are really inflammatory especially to thyroid patients and so and i will tell you that that's funny that you say that because for me i i am i go back and forth on being dairy free i'm not 100 percent dairy free i want to be i i just when i kind of i'm like you know in your kind of screw it moments you're like oh my gosh i have to have you know, a little bit of whipped cream or I'll have, you know, who knows what with dairy. Yeah. I just, that is one area that is very difficult for me to give up. So I, I go back Same. and forth on it. I go back and forth. Yeah. And it may not bother you. I just don't think dairy bothers me. I do know wheat does. I know because the way I eat now, if I do have some wheat on our one meal Friday or Saturday night, whatever we do, and I'm, we're probably going to eliminate that. 
you know, I have a headache immediately or my hip hurts or I'm congested. So, and sugar does it to me too. And I'm so sad. I love sugar. I love you. I've never stopped (laughs) loving you. That's right. Well, this has been amazing. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. So Lisa at Lisa uh, or Lisa Fisher said.com is um, my website and you can, there's an email portal. It would be Lisa at Lisa Fisher said my Instagram is Lisa Fisher said Um, my podcast is the Lisa Fisher said podcast. Twitter, Lisa Fisher said, Pinterest, Lisa. I mean, if remember, Lisa Fisher said it, then you need to do it. And I say that not pridefully. I say that because I do a lot of research. That's the journalist in me. Remember, I said I've been a radio, TV journalist, news reporter, anchor, personality for 35 years. So with that, I do a lot of research. So I don't sell things unless I'm using it and I can't be bought. You know, like you, I get people all the time. Will you talk about this? If I'm not using it, I'm not going to talk about it. Or if I wouldn't use it. You know, I love my bio bioptimizers. Is that what do you have bioptimizers, magnesium? Yes. Yeah, I love it. It's it is my magical. Favorite. Yeah. In fact, someone reached out to me the other day. She goes, I hear all the podcasters talking about it. So it made me suspicious. Like, y'all are just doing that because you're being paid. I went, No, it's the best stuff the there best. is. It really yes. is the best. So do, and the Redmond Relight Salt. Have you done that? Mm-hmm. It's really good. Now that's a great way to get your potassium and there's magnesium electrolytes in that. It's mm-hmm. Redmond, Redmond Relight. Um, there is another one, but it's more expensive. And so I like Redmond Relight and it comes in a plane that you can have in the morning with no flavor. And then I'm, I've got the mango strawberry downstairs right now that I'll have later when I open my feasting window. Because remember, it doesn't matter how many calories, it's it matters that you have flavors introduced and then insulin has to come show up. And I don't want him come to show up unless I need him. You know, I, I'm glad that you said that because it's like, what what happens, I think a lot of times is, is, you know, even in this other one where someone says, you know, I start to feel nauseous or I'm not feeling good. Yeah. That's why I'm not doing the fasting as long. And I would say a huge portion of those people, they are deficient in electrolytes. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I didn't mention that earlier. You're exactly yes. right. Yes. You're exactly you right. You have to have your micronutrients of hydration for your cells for them to work the best. And so I think people don't realize how important electrolytes are. It's funny, my son plays a lot of uh, sports and he's uh, what I call a thin eater in my book. And he basically all the time, every night I give, he always asks for pickles. And he says, that's why little mini dill pickles. Mm -hmm. And he's like, mom, can you make me, I make him a charcuterie board every night. And he's like, make sure you put the pickles on there, mom. And he craves them. And why it's because he's been doing sports and he needs those electrolytes. Doesn't that make everybody's mouth water? Just talking about the pickles. (laughs) Like my mouth just went. Um, that's so good so well thank you so much for being back with us you are amazing as always well i feel the same way about you (laughs) and you guys stay tuned we've got another episode coming up in just a few bye-bye for now